I don't know about you, but there's something about the name Jesus that even Paul, while in prison, would say at the name of Jesus that every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess. And if you know that that name still works, can you just put your hands together and just bless the name of Jesus? I mean, if you really know that it works, sickness in your body, you call it on that name. Trouble in your home, you call it on that name. And some grandmother can testify that at that name, you've been able to keep on going when you felt like giving up. Come on, let's celebrate the name of Jesus. Come on, look up towards heaven and say, it works. Amen. Well, listen, how blessed of God we are that God in Christ has afforded us this privilege and this opportunity to gather for such a time as this to give God praise and to give God worship, but also to celebrate God's man in the person of Pastor Terry Keith Anderson for 32 years of pastoral leadership. Preacher par excellence, how we give God praise. Come on, we could do better than that. Let's celebrate him on this day, another day that the Lord has made. To God be the glory for all of the wonderful things that God has done. And certainly to his lovely wife, amen, your first lady, amen. And certainly to my pastor, the Reverend Dr. T.R. Williams, amen, and his lovely wife who is here, how we salute and celebrate them. To my friend and brother, Reverend Washington, and to all of these pastors, amen, and to the officers and the members of this church, indeed, I greet you greetings on this day, another day that God has made. Listen, on a Tuesday night, I don't want to hold you long, but if you have your Bibles, why don't you run with me to 1 Samuel chapter 30, and I want to begin reading a very familiar passage of Scripture, beginning in verse number 1, and we'll conclude in verse number 6. I pray that you would read this passage when you get home in its entirety. 1 Samuel chapter 30, beginning in verse number 1, and it came to pass when David and his men were come to Ziklag on the third day that the Amalekites had invaded the south and Ziklag and smitten Ziklag and burned it with fire and had taken the women captives that were therein. They slew not any, either great or small, but carried them away and went on their way. So David and his men came to the city and behold, it was burned with fire. And their wives and their sons and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people that were with him lifted up their voice and wept until they had no more power to weep. And David's two wives were taken captives, Anamon, Jezreelites, and Abigail, the wife of the Baal, the Carmelite. And David was greatly distressed, for the people spake of stoning him, because the soul of all the people were grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters but David encouraged himself in the Lord his God I want to talk tonight from this thought finding the strength to keep going finding the strength to keep going recently I was perusing YouTube and while I was perusing YouTube I ran across if you will an interview that took place with President uh, Barack Obama during that particular season, he looked mighty bright, did not have any gray in his hair. He was excited about what was to happen in his four-year term. He talked about all of the things that he had anticipated, the things that he thought that he would do for our country and even our nation. We fast forward again in this YouTube video, and I fast forward into his last term. When we fast forward, I noticed this president who was once black-haired, had now turned gray. In a matter of four years, he had now started to age, and the wear and tear on his leadership had now started showing up on his face. 
the midst of listening to this interview, Trevor Noah began to start asking him some peculiar and specific questions. He started asking him, do you see a difference in your leadership when you first started and when you're coming to the very end and the culmination of your two terms? President Barack Obama leaned back in the chair and said, there are a few things that I would like to talk about. He says, the first thing I want to submit is that in the first four years, everyone was on my side. Everyone agreed with what I had to say. As long as I was meeting their preferences, as long as I was doing what they thought needed to be done, they were excited about my leadership. But he said, I found out all too familiar things that when you stop identifying with people's preferences, they'll stop supporting you as they used to. When he started talking again, Trevor Noah asked him another question. He says, are the same people that supported you in the first four years still with you in the last four years of your leadership? He laughed again, leaned back in the chair and said, these individuals that started out with me are no longer with me. In fact, some of them have gone to the other side. And I want to submit to you that it is in this season and the life of the president that it reminds us that all of us who stick to become leaders in the economy of God will always have to deal with the struggle and the strife of those who start out with us and do not support us when it comes to the culmination of our leadership. When we begin to look at what is happening here, he gives him another question that caught me off guard. He says, when you feel like you're not being supported, when you feel like people are no longer hoisting you up and supporting you and showing up with their presence and their time. He says, how do you keep going when you felt like giving up? He says, if you want to know the truth, I could not look to the White House. I could not look to family members and friends. He says, I had to stand stout and resolute in the faith that I believe that God could keep me when I could not keep myself. And I want to submit to you, friends, that if you're going to lead, if you're going to be a part of what God is doing in the economy of the believers of the saints, that you're going to have to wrestle through how to keep going when you feel like giving up. So it is in our text today, as we look at the movement of what's going on in the life of David, David has been on the run for the better part of his ministry. He has now found himself with the king of the Akish and the Gath and the Philistines, and his 600 strong men have been now working for the other side. In the midst of what's going on, David and these company of individuals have now spent the better part in their lives in Ziklag with their families and their friends. When David leaves now, he is now fighting a war that does not necessarily belong to him. But David is fighting, and in the midst of his fighting, the Bible says that the Amicalites show up and raid the camp. They raid the camp, take the family members and friends, and destroy everything that they had worked so hard to literally build up. When the men of David show back up to the camp with David, they start to weep and cry because they realize that all that they loved, all that they cared for had now been taken away. In the midst of their crying, in the midst of their tears, they now start to get angry and talk about stoning Brother David. This same David that when these 600 men had been put out of the camp of Saul that showed up in the cave of Adullam and we record Psalm 34 when they say, I will bless the Lord with all my soul. The Bible says that these men show up in the midst and David takes them in and now when trouble shows up, these individuals talk about stoning David. It is here that the Bible says that David was full of distress. David was worried. David was frustrated. But David does not turn to family members. David does not turn to friends. But David finds his strength in the Lord. And I want to submit to you, friends, that if you're going to keep going forward, if you're going to keep working in the economy of God, if you're going to keep putting one foot in front of the next, you're going to have to stick to your 
yourself that I'm going to stay right there and let God use me in the midst of what I'm dealing with. Here it is, friends, that if you're going to find strength to keep going on, that if you're going to find strength in the midst of what you're struggling with, you're going to have to learn how to find your strength in God and God alone. Listen to David again as David says, but David strengthened himself in the Lord. I like that because the first thing I believe that this text is tailored to teach us tonight is that when you lack external support, God will supply internal strength to keep you going. Here it is, friends. In verse number six, we find one of the most eloquent words in the Bible. This conjunction, but. The Bible says that David had lost it all. And yet David says, but David finds strength in the Lord. I like that. David's only worldly possessions at the moment were the clothes that he wore on his back. Everything else was gone. His property was gone. His family was gone. The raiders had smoldered his home. And in the midst of it all, David said that I strengthened myself in the Lord. But there was one thing that the Amicalites had not taken from David. They could not take his God. Although he could no longer, according to scripture, to say my house. No longer could he say my city. No longer could he say my possessions. He could say my God. And I submit to those of you who are here today that whatever you're dealing with, things may be taken from you, but the testimony tonight, the shout tonight is that you can testify that I still have my God. Like that because it is Alexander McLaren who states it this way. He says, whatever else we lose, as long as we have him, we are rich. Whatever else we possess, we are rich not because of what we have, but because of what we know and who we know. Life had reduced all of David's options. And friends, sooner or later, life does the same to all of us. Life can reduce your options. And the solution for every person tonight is God. When David's men turned on him in their despair, Scripture says that he strengthened himself in the Lord. David strengthened his heart in the midst of being broken. David strengthened his heart in the midst of being dismissed. David strengthened his heart in the midst of people walking out on him. And I want to submit for 32 years that you know what it feels like to have folk to start out with you and leave you. But thanks be unto God that in the midst of everything that you've been through, you've learned how to strengthen yourself. In the, is there anybody here tonight that can testify that when folk walk out on you, that you have learned how to strengthen yourself in the Lord? Bible says that David now is in a difficult situation, perhaps the lowest situation that he's dealing with in his life. But David prevails because he does things God's way. Because David understands that if you're going to march and do what God intends you to do, you got to be obedient to do it God's way. Before he does anything else, he resolves to gather his strength from God. He has no strength left of his own. So he finds strength in God. In his distress, he invites God into his situation. Because David understands that if there's anybody that can help me in my distress, certainly it's brother God. He says, if anybody can help me in the midst of what I'm going through, it got to be God. And David says that I found my strength, my heart strength in my relationship with God. I like that because scripture teaches us that it's possible for others to strengthen us in the Lord. And that is why scripture teaches us in 1 Samuel chapter 23, verse number 16, that Jonathan earlier had strengthened David. Jonathan, in the midst of what David was going through, had encouraged him to remember the promises of God. He says in 1 Samuel 23, in verse number 17, do not fear for the hand of Saul shall not find you. You shall be the king over Israel. Every now and again, friends, then you need some Jonathans to remind you of the promises of God. 
every now and then you need some folk to encourage you and testify to what God is doing through you. But this time, David does not need a friendly nudge. He needed more than a friendly pep talk. He needed more than encouraging words from his friends. He needed a strength that was bigger than he was. And there's somebody that showed up tonight and you need more than a friendly pep talk. You need something that's bigger than you are. And there ought to be some folk that can testify that God is bigger than any situation that you and I can deal with. Here it is. This world, friends, is uh, a hurtful place. It is unpredictable to try. Uh, many of us have gone through struggles and strife, and we need the strength of the Lord to keep us when we ultimately cannot keep ourselves. And that is why the psalmist writes in Psalm 28, in verse number 7, the Lord is my strength and my shield. He is my heart's trust in him, and I am helped. Friends, hard times will either make you bitter or it'll make you better. And if we're honest about it, there are those of us who have showed up tonight and even online that life has made you bitter. That there have been moments where you don't feel like saying hallelujah because life has made you bitter. You saw your life wrote it out differently and it just seems like it's going in another direction. Many of us here tonight have been bitter about the course of our lives, but David helps us to appreciate that you can become better when you let God into the center of your life. Strengthening yourself, friends, in the Lord is an intentional act. It is not something that just happens to us. When it says David strengthened himself in the Lord, the Hebrew verb here implies persistence. It implies a continuous effort. It means that every morning David got up, he had to get up and strengthen himself in the Lord. It meant that when he went to sleep and woke up in the morning, that he had to realize that there are moments in your life that you got to learn how to strengthen yourself. And so David understood that if he was going to be strengthened in God, when everybody else had left him, he had to learn how to strengthen himself internally and stop looking for external forces to give him what he already has. And I like that because David helps us to understand that there's nothing passive about seeking out the Lord in times of despair. Helps us, friends, to appreciate that you and I must come to the place that we uh, grab ourselves in a shirt collar and begin to start having our own personal pep talk. That when life is beating you up, sometimes you gotta grab yourself by the collar and say, boy, girl, don't you let them forget where you came from. You may have started out bad, but it's not how you start. Somebody shout, it's how you finish. So David helps us friends to understand that in the midst of what you're dealing with, you got to learn how to grab yourself in the collar and internally encourage yourself. But then secondly, I want you to see that when you are at your lowest, you can find strength through prayer to keep on going. Because when we look at verse number seven, the text says that David said to Abathar the priest, Amalek's son, please bring the ephod here to me. And Abathar brought the ephod unto David. It seems obvious that David had not sought the Lord's leadership in his decision to attach himself to the men of the Kish and the king of the Gath. But the reality is that even in David's violation and being disobedient and not trusting in God, David understood in this present moment that the situation that he was in demanded that he go to God. It's funny because when we look at the context of this scripture, we are reminded of a contrast, if you will, that takes place. Because on one hand, Saul, he finds the witches of Endor. But David goes and encourages himself by finding God. The Saul goes and finds the witches of Endor, which suggests that he finds an external, non-spiritual medium to give him answers for spiritual things. And I want to submit to you, friends, that that becomes the challenge of the Christian experience that 
we have so many things that are at force and challenging what we know that the Bible says that you and I ought to do. And the Bible teaches us that David recognizes that if he was going to stay strengthened by God, that he would have to go to God in prayer. Because David understood that prayer really can change some things. David understood that when you go to God in prayer, that God can answer your questions. God can deal with whatever you're going through. And there's somebody that can testify tonight that there's no struggle that is too big that your God can't handle. And so, brothers and sisters, it is a reminder to us once again that we do not know the timeline. But it's possible that at the very same time, that David is seeking guidance from God, that Saul is going to the witches of Endor. David is going directly to God with his problem. Saul is trying to use a medium to learn God's will. Stay with me. The witches of Endor are symbolic of the wisdom of men. So Saul, who's supposed to be God's anointed, decides that he's going to get an answer for spiritual issues by going to a medium and a witch. Stay with me. Saul seeks earthly wisdom that will only yield human involvement. Okay, let me see if I can help y'all see this. Human involvement is limited. Let church say limited. So anytime you try to get human involvement, there are limits to what humans can do. But David sought God, which suggests that he needed divine intervention. Okay, y'all didn't get this. Okay, let me see if I can show you this. There's a limit to what we can do. And David says, no, nah, I ain't going to y'all because y'all wanted to stone me. He says, but I'm going to go somewhere where I can get divine intervention that is not limited by human capabilities, but that can do what no other power can do, that can supersede what the world says can be done. And so David says, I'm going to go to a power that can deal with whatever I'm going through. But then, friends, last thing, and I'm in my seat, is that when you are obedient to God, you can keep going knowing that you will recover it all. Right here in Scripture, if David was going to recover it all. He would have to recover it by being obedient to the will of God. Verse number eight, we receive clear instruction from God. God tells David after he encourages himself, after he strengthens himself. Scripture says that in verse number eight, he says, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them and without fail, recover it all. Yeah. Let me say that one more time because y'all miss y'all shouting, Q. He says, pursue, for you shall surely overtake them. And without fail, you shall recover it all. God tells David to pursue the Amicalites. David pursues them in obedience to God. And when they get to Bessor, the brook of Bessor, 200 men are too tired to keep going with David. David does not show up with 600 strong men of Israel. But rather, David goes to recover it all with less than what he started with. They stay behind at the brook. And once again, in faith, David continues to pursue with 400 men remaining. Stay with me. Mark it down, friends. Everyone can go with you when it's time to recover it all. Here it is. You have to be okay leaving some folk behind if you're going to get where God is intending for you to go. And the question tonight is are you willing to recover it all? The question tonight are are you willing to leave some folk behind? The question tonight are you willing to go if they won't go? And David understood that if he was going to recover what God intended for him to recover, that he was going to have to be obedient to the will of God, that he was going to have to do what God had intended him to do. 
David understood that if he was going to recover what the Amalekites had stole from him, that he was going to have to march in obedience unto God. That he was going to have to do what God told him to do. He was going to have to first learn how to encourage himself. And that means that he might have to pray by himself. That means that he might have to worship by himself. That means that he might have to praise God by himself. And so I don't know who I'm talking to tonight. But you showed up here depressed. You showed up here worried. But I showed up tonight to say that you got to find strength in the Lord. That even though folk won't go with you, that you got to learn how to lean on God and know that God can keep you when you cannot keep yourself. But you, secondly, you got to learn how to pray to God. You got to learn how to talk to God. You got to learn how to tell him all about your struggles. Is there anybody here today that don't mind testifying? That you've learned how to talk to God. You've learned how to testify to his word. You've learned how to tell him all about your worries. You've learned how to tell him about your struggles. You've learned how to know that he'll answer. Somebody shout by and by. Whatever you're going through right now, you got to find strength from within. You got to remember that God has already brought you. And whatever storm you're going through right now, That he has power to bring you through it. He has power to bring you over it. Is there anybody here tonight that don't mind testifying that the Lord will bring you through it? That the Lord will bring you over it? Whatever it looks like right now, be not dismayed. Because whatever be tied, somebody shout God will take care of you if you're going to recover it all. Everybody can't go where you're going. You're going to have to learn how to leave some folk behind. And no doubt over 30 years, you've had to leave some folk behind. You've had to learn how to encourage yourself that when the church wouldn't go with you, you knew what God told you to do. And as a result, you kept on marching in the midst of struggle. You kept on marching when folk wouldn't go with you. You kept on marching when folk left you. You kept on marching when folk talked about you. You kept on marching when folk were ridiculing you. But thanks be unto God that you were obedient to his word. And obedience is better than sacrifice. When you learn how to trust God, you can find strength to keep on going. You can find strength to give God praise. You can find strength to give God worship. Is there anybody here today that knows you can find strength? How do you know you can find strength? Because over 40 and two generations, God sent his only begotten son that he would die on an old rugged cross and stay in a borrowed tomb all day Friday, all day Saturday. But somebody shout bright early, Sunday morning. He had Sunday morning power. He had eternal power. And even on a Tuesday night, you can still have strength to face your tomorrow. You can still have strength to face your dilemma. Somebody knows God can do it. Well, do me one favor, won't you? Look at your neighbor tonight and say, neighbor, I don't know what you're going through and I don't know the burden that you're bearing, but you got to start finding strength in yourself, knowing greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Somebody shout yes. Find strength to keep going. If you're going to find strength to keep going, you're going to first have to have an eternal support system that no matter what's going on, that you've learned how to depend on what you know about God. And then secondly, you're going to have to learn how to take your burdens to God. Prayer really does work. 
And when you are obedient to the will of God, he said by his word that you shall recover it all. And the people of God said, amen.